Uh, I'm really excited about this. Yes, we are going to start a little bit early, but uh, heck, you guys read the program. We're going to cover a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, a real quick anecdote. Uh, I'm a big fan of Social Engineer Toolkit and all the stuff that you guys do. Funny thing, when I'm, when I'm back home, I do a lot of security awareness talks for other attorneys. And this spring, I did a live demo. It was crazy. And did a live demo of Social Engineer Toolkit. And who's in the audience but the Chief Justice of the Missouri Supreme Court. Awesome. So you've been terrifying a lot of powerful people for a long time, and I'm really excited to see the new stuff. Awesome. Let's give them a big hand. Wow, it's Sunday and you're all still here, so a round of applause for you. I'm sure everybody's experiencing delayed reactions, headaches, um, so we have a lot of um, like shrieking and, and loud noises throughout our presentation. Uh, just to kind of keep it uh, fresh and content here wise. Just kidding. Uh, just a quick intro. I'm Dave Kennedy. Um, you know, I started Trusted Sec in Binary Defense, which is my company's. Um, and, you know, what's funny is, uh, you know, I just saw somebody here that I used to work with in the military. And it's funny how you kind of see all of the people that, um, you know, you kind of grow through in this, this industry with, as well as a whole bunch of new people uh, that are coming into the industry. And I got to um, get a hug yesterday. I'm a big hugger guy, but. I got a hug yesterday from somebody that was just coming into the industry saying, you know, hey, I'm so passionate about what I'm doing, I'm learning from all of this, and I'm learning from everybody else. And that's the biggest thing that, that you know, when I was coming into DEF CON, I think DEF CON 8 or 9 was my first DEF CON, and uh, the thing that I came into and I learned about was just learning from other people because everybody's so damn smart in this industry, um, and no one knows everything else that the other person knows. So it's all about that and that community, and DEF CON's such a great place for that, and I mean, have to give a round of applause to everybody that makes DEF CON possible, the goons that, that you know, cleared up all the traffic flow um, after the first day, you know, giving their nights and, uh, you know, their nights and nights and nights and nights and nights uh, over and over again. Let's give a round of applause for everybody at DEF CON. So um, I authored uh, the Social Engineer Toolkit, uh, a couple of other tools. Um, I'm actually going to be showing a, a one today called the Pentesters Framework, which I added a new module in for a pivoter that Jeff wrote uh, that we're going to be releasing today. Um, but we'll get into that. Jeff? Oh, this is Jeff's first time presenting at, uh, at DEF CON, so can we give him a round of applause for getting up here and having balls? All right, well, uh, as, as David already introduced me, I'm Jeff Walton. I'm a senior uh, security consultant at Trusted Sec. Um, one of the things I do like to do a little bit on the side when I get time is to actually write some tools and, and create some things. Um, I've offered, authored a tool called Ships uh, that's uh, pretty popular. And uh, recently I wrote a tool called Pivoter. Um, so that's uh, kind of who I am. So Dave's going to talk a little more about uh, kind of the history of pen testing and, and stuff like that and, and what we do at Trusted Tech. So uh, real quick, and when we come up with acronyms for, for tools, it's kind of funny. Um, chips was actually going to be chips because one of our guys ate seven bags of chips one time in one sitting. So we're going to, in his honor, name, uh, name chips after this specific tool. But unfortunately, we couldn't come up with a good acronym for chips. So it ended up changing it to chips, which kind of sounds piratey. Um, so it sounded pretty good. But Pivoter was one of those ones where, you know, just sounded kind of cool. And I think, what was your original name for it? Proxy something or other? So this is, oh, that mic's not hot. So this is kind of funny. Um, actually, Dave, Dave seems to have a habit. I, I come up with very boring, rather destructive names for my tools that, that pretty much say what they actually do. I originally called this thing Proxy Kit, and like every th other thing I write, Dave uh, immediately renamed it, um, which is awesome because Dave's names are really better. Sweet. All right. So we'll get, we'll get into the talk here. Um, look a little bit about the history of, of how attackers kind of move and, and kind of our challenges as pen testers uh, in the past. You know, if you look at um, pen testing in general, right? I may hear pen tester, like a whole bunch of people. It's awesome. Um, the first thing that we do as an attack is we go after an infrastructure. Right? We try to find an exposure, whether that's social engineering or going after you know a specific attack on a web application or whatever it ends up being. We end up finding a flaw, we compromise that, and then we get access to one system, right? And we get access to that one system, and that one system, if we have elevated rights, we have the ability to kind of move over into other systems, right? And then from there we try to go after a couple other things and get a little bit more information here and a little more information here. It's like a puzzle, right? We kind of put together a little puzzle until we get access to the stuff that we want access to. And so if you look at that, you know, the whole lateral movement thing is a big, you know, talk right now. Um, it's been difficult for us, I guess, in the industry, unless you're using something like, like Pro versions. Like Metasploit Pro, for example, has a VPN functionality where if you compromise, you can, you know, tunnel and pivot through a, a, a interpreter session. Or, you know, like Cobalt Striker, those ones have the ability to tunnel if you have administrative overrides, right? 
So all of these different things are um, concepts that we use every single day and then attackers use every single day uh, to go after specific targets and then from there move across the network. So to kind of talk a little bit about that, if you look at lateral movement, you compromise one system, right? And there's like random Chuck Norris things throughout this whole presentation. There's no relevance to them whatsoever. Um, but if you look at lateral movement in an organization, it's about compromising a system, getting information, whether that's credentials or, you know, clear text credentials with, with Mimikatz or something, and then spraying across the network and going to other systems to get access to them. And so in that case, you know, we look at that and say, well, it's difficult in a lot of cases to escalate our permissions sometimes. Like, if, for example, let's just say you have a, um, you know, an organization that doesn't run at administrative level rights or you compromise, you know, a network service account, uh, something that you have the ability to, to target and you have access to a system, but maybe there's not enough information on that system to get you to another one to, to move laterally in the environment. So that's been experience of mine and Jeff's at, uh, in almost every pen test that you run into that you target an individual or an organization that has very limited permissions uh, to actually go about that. And so, you know, when we look at that, when you look at um, what we do as pen testers, it's really about thinking outside of the box, right? We have to come up with creative ways to navigate security restrictions or mechanisms that are in place to stop us from attacking different things. And in most cases, we do. We, we get crafty. I mean, maybe we find that our one exploitation method that we got into wasn't successful, right? And then we go to another avenue that may have been successful. And then from there, we may go to other systems that may get us, you know, the, the types of information that we need. But it requires us to think outside the box. And unfortunately, today, the focus, the focus has really been around just getting domain admin rights, right? And I see someone taking a picture uh, of that, that screen. I apologize. Don't Google uh, clock and forget the L. Um, but when you look at a lot of the types of attacks that we do um, and the types of methods we do, it's mostly around getting domain administrative level rights, right? If we get DA, that's it, and that's kind of how we, uh, you know, target our tests. But that's not really what we're seeing out there as far as attackers. Attackers want access to information. They want access to things that make us unique um, in organizations. Like, for example, you know, everybody's always worried about PII and credit card data. Well, that's great for, like, the retail space, right? But for manufacturing, that's less of a concern. I mean, customer information is always a concern. But manufacturing is focused more on, you know, how do we make the product, the chemical compounds, our, our, you know, who our, our suppliers are and how much we pay for those types of products and, and the vendors between those. So those are the intellectual property pieces that, that make that company unique as an organization. And we don't really target that as part of what we simulate as an attack. So we're kind of at a disadvantage and we're not really simulating how attackers go after an organization uh, to really try to attack those different types of areas. So for me, um, looking at this, we have to evolve to a different type of, of, of framework or a different type of way of attacking organizations. It's not to say that what we're doing is, is not right. It's just we need to think a little bit differently in our mindsets of going in. It's not about smashing and getting root and then, you know, using root to get access to another system and from there we own them and then we high five each other and then we give them a report of how awesome we own them, right? It's more so about how do we go after an organization and figure out what makes them tick, what makes them unique, and how do we target them to go after them in a way that, that is beneficial. And how can we do that with the types of techniques that the attackers are using and what we can use in, in, our, in our own arsenal? That's where we'll talk a little bit here in just a second about Pivoter and the release of Pivoter and what that actually does. So for me, um, if I'm a sophisticated attacker, right, I'm going to go after what makes a company unique. I'm going to go after what makes them, you know, unusual. And what's interesting today is that, you know, if you look at, at kind of the history of, of breaches, you know, you saw, and I hate to mention, you know, the specific breaches because we've all been hurt, we had it hyped in the media, but it's a specific point. When Target happened, you had executives that were fired, right? If you look at the past, you know, maybe five breaches in the past year and a half, you notice they've all blamed them on sophisticated hackers. And it's like a crux of like, hey, you know, we got targeted by sophisticated hackers. Even though we've neglected security for the past 10 years and we haven't, you know, funded a security for the past 10 years and we haven't given security any light of day, we still got targeted by a sophisticated attack, so now that's okay. Right? And by the way, the sophisticated attacks are like four lines of bash. So does anybody here know how to, how to, how to write a couple lines in bash, a little four loop in bash? You are all APTs. Congratulations. <laughs> sophisticated attacks are bullshit. It's all about everybody being targeted. We're all getting targeted. It's a matter of if we've got targeted or not and how often your, your security program is up to date and refreshed as an organization. And so if you look at that, we now have an excuse in security to say, well, if I'm ever targeted by an attacker that, that I might attribute to North Korea, I might attribute to China, I might attribute to, to Russia, it's just a sophisticated attack, so it's okay. It's not okay. And we need to be building defenses against those. And I'll talk a little bit about what a targeted attack looks like in some of the areas that, that we struggle with sometimes when we're doing our pen tests. So this one was a fun one. Uh, you know, we get to go on red team engagements. And, you know, you have the traditional pen testing, like, hey, we want an internal external pen test. Hey, this is for PCI or, hey, this is for whatever. 
But every once in a while you get a customer that's like, hey, I want you to do like a full scope red team engagement, right? And there's different maturity levels of that. Like customers that really want a red team a lot of times are like, well, I want you to do a red team engagement, but like literally you have to do it between like 3 and 4 p.m. on Tuesday and you can't break in anything and you can only talk to one person. And so, you know, in cases like that, it's not really a red team, right? But in this case, um, this customer is actually pretty awesome and uh, wanted us to do an attack against them simulating a red team and any method was, was available. Like whatever you wanted to do aside from like breaking windows and punching people in the face, right? You couldn't do that apparently. We asked, you know, like, well, if we get busted, can we punch people in the face and run away? No, okay, cool. We don't really punch people in the face. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hugger. I would have hugged them. But, uh, you know, the whole purpose was this. They had spent a lot of time on R&D and protecting uh, research and development and intellectual property for the future products. And why that's important, you know, manufacturing companies, um, the sustainability of them really depends on their products and how they can refresh their products and get to market with those products. If someone gets a hold of them well ahead of them releasing, it's very disastrous, especially if it's other countries competing against them or other different types of, of competitors. So the R&D piece where they do the research on the next type, next, I'll use the word next generation type of product line, right? A lot of times that's the most important piece of the sustainability long term of an organization, whether or not they can still compete. I came from a company, you know, that really had a tough time diversifying themselves in the market that they were in and had a tough time in their next product lines and are still suffering because they couldn't keep up with what they were trying to do. And so in this case, the customer wanted us to target it and actually go after them in a way um, that actually compromised them in any way I wanted to. So the first thing, you know, I'm like, well, I'll go after fishing, right? Because that's the easiest. Fishing's always great. And so with fishing, you know, obviously creating a, a scenario or something that's believable is one of the most important pieces. So creating a fantasy. What I, what, I, what I started to do first is like looking at what I could do to compromise them. So I started looking at their outside and I, I found a, uh, a file upload vulnerability that allowed me to pop a web shell. And if you, if you anybody been in a web shell before under IAS, like a user account, very limited, right? You don't have you know, a squat to do anything with network service. Like you can't escalate permissions, you can't grab Kerberos tokens in a lot of cases. You're really restricted to usually like the INET pub directory or whatever the, the directory is running in. Sometimes you can find like a web config file, sometimes you can find sensitive data that you can use to maybe tunnel and piggyback to a, a, a SQL server or something like that. But in a lot of cases you're pigeonholed in that environment um, that you can't move in different directions. So I was kind of at a dead end at this point. We hadn't made Pivoter yet, so that would have been really nice by the way, Jeff. Thank you. So anyways, I had to do a little hard work here. And uh, what we ended up doing is, is um, using that website and, and, and creating a sub, a sub website um, of that website to, to be like a survey you know, type thing. And we had a username and password field and stuff like that in there. And then we started you know, by thinking like, well, if I go and I can create a website that's on the customer's domain and I can send emails to a customer with that domain in there, it's probably pretty legit. And so what we ended up doing is uh, we sent it out to um, a couple of, um, of folks and we ended up compromising uh, someone in the sales organization, which salespeople were like, Phenomenal, they're great. You know, like you can have salespeople do anything you want to. Like, especially if you're gonna give them money, that's the best. Like, they'll be like, hey, can you like disable your antivirus so you can open up this Excel macro document that says virus.xls? Sure, no problem. Okay, cool. Am I still gonna get the sale? Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, but, anyways, we used that and we, we compromised them and we got access to the, the OWA account. I don't understand companies still. Like, I would say predominantly, like 90% of the customers that we, we run into, VPN is two factor and their OWA is not. So like you have access to full OWA access but you don't have access to, to VP, VPN which it like OWA is like for a hacker is like the best piece that could ever happen because you already have established lines of communication and trust. So if you have trust already and you already have communications where you're, someone's already talking and sending emails back and forth, it's really easy to send them something you're like bloop, you know, click that and they click it and they're compromised, right? So a lot of times it's very easy to um, attack somebody through OWA as a mechanism for those. And what's funny about like two factor for example, uh, you may have heard of uh, phone factor right? It's a two-factor authentication solution. There's, all, there's also a couple other ones too. But has anybody got the ones where like it'll actually call you and ask you if you're logging in or it'll give you a push notification if you want to allow it to log you in or not? Do you know how bad that is from a security perspective? How many times have been on a pen test? The past like seven to ten pen tests that have that type of functionality where it actually calls you or will say are you logging in right now? Allow or deny? How many times they just hit allow because they think they're logging in somewhere? Like literally you just, I, I went to a pen test one time broke in, logged in, with two, you know, logged in with my username and password and it's like, please wait while we call you. And I'm like, oh crap. And I'm like, uh oh, I'm busted. You know, and I, there, there goes my whole fish. There's, you know, two days worth of work and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden you log in and you're sitting there and you're waiting at the screen so you're like, okay, I'm screwed. I'm going to have to start building a new pretext. And all of a sudden you log in you're like, that was, that was weird. <laughs> so whenever you give the users the ability to error, what will they do? They will error, right? Unless you teach them right. But in most cases, like two factor authentication, if it's not implemented properly, is also a problem. So just saying uh, from a caveat. But, anyways, they didn't have two factor in OBA, so it didn't make a difference. So, what was interesting is um, 
If you're familiar with a tool that I wrote called Unicorn, it does uh, PowerShell injection um, and it does um, a, a native x86 um, shellcode injection through PowerShell and then it injects into uh, memory and then it you know, gives you a interpreter shell through there, right? And so the, the uh, last version of Unicorn, and you can get it from our GitHub site, so GitHub.com slash trusted sec, um, it's a, literally you just run this command and it gives you a one liner PowerShell command that you can push on any system that you have remote command ex uh, execution on and it just gives you a shell. It's like magic. Um, that's why it's called Magic Unicorn. It has ASCII art that has a uh, red um, unicorn. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, but anyways, so with Unicorn, uh, there's also another attack that has um, uh, Excel injection for for um, for macros. And what's great about macros is they're kind of like the thing in the past because you'd always put like you know VBS scripts or binaries and things like that in there, and then those would usually get flagged. But in this case, with with a lot of the macros, you can just do straight PowerShell injection, never touches disk. And what's great about PowerShell too is that it's usually a um, whitelisted application, so things like Bit9, things like that, aren't going to pick it up. So you have the ability to get remote code execution on a system that has application whitelisting, that has next generation stuff, because it's all in memory, which is fantastic. Um, but in this case, what we found out is that um, they were using a sandbox uh, technology, so they had um, you know, some sort of virtualization technology. Does everybody know how virtualization technology works, right? So you know, something comes in via an email. Uh, whether it's incoming or a web gateway, and then if it doesn't look right, you know, or it's a certain type of, of file pattern, it'll actually virtualize it in a sandbox, and then it'll look to see all of the registry calls, you know, if it's doing have a C2 communications, um, anything like that. Well, in this case, they had something like that in place. So when I sent the macro, I got the initial stage, but then it just stopped, and it wasn't coming from the initial host that it was coming from. So I'm like, uh-oh, you know, they're using some sort of virtualization technology. And I'm not gonna say which one it was, but they all pretty much suck. So, um, but anyways. So we ended up uh, writing uh, um, some bypass uh, sandbox technology, and it's extremely complex. It took us multiple months of uh, you know exploit research and development to kind of get around it. But we're going to be releasing it today, which is awesome. Just kidding, it wasn't hard at all. It's like three lines of Python code. It took about 14 minutes. Um, most virtualization technology, um, the way that it works, um, is that they, they virtualize in a very predictable sandbox environment. Um, so if you can detect that you're in a sandbox environment, all you need to do is say, if I'm in something that is this pattern, then don't do anything, right? In this case, this, sa this specific sandbox technology, which actually works for like two of the main three, I think, um, if they're using less than one CPU or one, uh, less than two CPU cores, so they use one CPU core. Does anybody here have a, a computer that has one CPU core? <laughs> well, sir, I'd like to talk to you because uh, you <laughs> probably couldn't hack you. Or, or, man, I'm sorry, I can't see it that far. Nice. Oh no. Is this ice? No, 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 don't tell me it's ice. Not ice, not ice. Okay, it's not ice, thank God. Just a shot, okay. I thought it was ice for a second there. <laughs> Thanks for You gotta do it? Okay. Deep Kentucky. Apparently. I gotta do it? Gotta do oh, I gotta do it, alright. That was easy. I thought it was going to be a warm ice. That would have been terrible. Oh. So in most cases, they're using less than one CPU core or less than two CPU cores. Um, what you say is, if I'm using in this environment, then don't do anything. So when it comes in and it says, "Well, am I making any registry changes or anything else?" If I'm running in one CPU core, then just shut itself down and quit. So then it's like, "Oh, it's all good. It's cool." And then it passes it off to the end user. So I just built that into PowerShell. Um, and so when it actually executed, it checked to see if it was in a specific uh, CPU core, and then it would shut itself down, and it got past uh, the virtualization uh, technology, which is great. About 14 minutes. So stupid. God. Anyways, um, so we ended up compromising uh, one of the boxes, one of the people, and I used, uh, I spent like probably a good 20 minutes going through um, a lot of those boxes, and I ended up compromising this one, and it took some time, um, but it was great as I already had a uh, established communication path into the environment, so I had a shell, which is great. Now, what was interesting is that the customer did a great job at, ne at network segmentation. And so we spent a long time trying to get to the R&D information, which really was difficult to do, and I couldn't find a way to get access to it. But I did find their physical access uh, system that, that allows you to print badges. So we ended up uh, finding their internet site, and it's like, hey, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this, step four. Did all of that, um, created a badge, and uh, walked up to the front desk, this is live footage on the right. Um, so walked into the building, picked up a badge, and walked into the, the facility. So, you know, I dressed the part, right? You go to this company and it's all like a suit and tie type thing. And so I, I, and I wore a, a, you know, suit and everything. I walk in and I go to this R&D place which has like R&D center of excellence. You know, it's like this big area with like smoke glass windows and everything. And like they spend a lot of time and money on this, right? And so I badge in and I hit my little pin to walk into the place because I added, added myself a pin number. And I walk in and it's like one of those moments where like you're like, I walked into the wrong place. Because you have all these people in like jeans and t-shirts and here I am in a suit, right? I walk into this R and D thing, and they're and they're like having this massive meeting of like 50 people, and everybody stops talking and looks at me. At that point, you're like, oh shit. I mean, like, do I walk in and do something, or do I back out and like you know pretend like, hey, wrong wrong room, guys, sorry, you know, one of those things. 
I'm like, yeah, screw it, why not? And so I walk in, right? And I walk around the side and they start talking again or doing whatever. And the worst thing happened, right? I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to like, you know, I was all nervous because there's people all around me and they're kind of like looking at me like, who's this dude in a suit? You know, is it, in, you know, whatever. And so I'm walking and all of a sudden I see this trash, or I, I fall over a trash can, a metal trash can. There's like mustard everywhere all over my suit. You know, people are picking me up off the ground. Like I honestly like sprained my ankle. It was terrible. Um, it's like one of those things that you never want to have happen in real life and it happens in real life and you're like, that was really me that did that. Um, so they're picking me off the ground, they're cleaning up the muscle, like, are you okay, are you okay, everything's right, well, 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 well. Anyways, it ended up working out okay. Um, but I was able to plant this um, device in, and, and I'm going to be open sourcing this uh, next week. Um, it's called the um, implant device, a tap device, um, which I've been working on for about a year. And uh, what it is is if you, um, if you're doing like physicals, you have a place to drop something. Um, if you use like an Intel Nook, have you ever heard of the Nooks? They're like a small, you know, tiny little, little thing. You can put an LTE card in it. I usually I put like 128 gigs of solid state uh, um, memory in it and then I put uh, you know, like 8 gigs of RAM. And then uh, what, what TAP does is it's a uh, software that basically uses the LTE network to do a reverse SSH uh, instance out of the network and it tries to find different ways out. It uses the LTE network first and then it um, uses the regular network second. And uh, Jeff actually wrote some software um, that we'll be releasing that actually does a full transparent uh, SS reverse SSH VPN into the environment. So you can actually create a TAP interface off of your device through an SSH tunnel onto the network itself and then you have a full VPN tunnel into it. Now, if anybody's ever used um, SSH tunnel, it's kind of like that but it's, it, it's more stable. Like if you've ever tried to do a port scan over SSH tunnel, it doesn't work. This is like a full TAP interface that you can actually VPN into the environment through an SSH tunnel itself, through an LTE network and do whatever you want to. And you can also, by the way, deploy this on any Linux machine itself. It doesn't need to be, you know, a tap device that you implant. If you compromise a, a Linux box, you deploy tap, it'll find a port out, it'll establish that reverse SSH connection and then you SSH VPN into that environment itself. So it works out really well. And what's nice about it is it's self-healing. So like if there's a, an issue with the operating system or an issue with the tunnel, it automatically reconstructs and rebuilds it um, and makes sure that the health of the operating system there keeps all of your tools up to date. So if you want to keep all of your tools local on itself, It'll actually use the reverse SSH tunnel out of the network to update the tools for you. Um, so, you know, you don't have to worry about outbound filters um, on, the, on the network itself um, for tools and updates. So, I'll go ahead and release that uh, uh, this coming week here uh, shortly. So, that's a new tool that uh, you should see in the, uh, the GitHub repos on TrustedSec uh, this week. So, github.com slash TrustedSec. So, on that, I could have skipped all of these steps. Tripping over the trash can, the mustard, if Jeff had ridden Pivoter earlier. So we can blame Jeff for this one and, and me having a sprained ankle. And still, I think it's bothered me a little bit. It's flared up yesterday. So, but anyways, we'll go ahead and introduce Pivoter. Okay. Well, um, it all started actually around this time last year when when Dave was talking to me about some of these engagements he'd been on and, and some of the trials he'd had. Um, specifically, he was, you know, is there anything like SSH for Windows that wouldn't need privileges so we could port forward? And I thought about it a little bit and I said, yeah, that, that seems kind of doable, what you're describing is, is really a, a SOX proxy but a reverse proxy, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we could implement that. Uh, of course I didn't get around to doing it until I started doing more of my own external pen test engagements and needed it myself and, and suddenly it was uh, a lot more uh, important. important to me, yeah, like Dave said. Um, what I've been, had been finding on a lot of pen tests is that, uh, Mostly bigger companies now, they have a security team, they're doing good things, they've got base, you know, platform baseline security configurations in place. Uh, it's not like 1990 anymore where you installed all of the SQL server management tools and stuff on every web server and, and stuff like that so you could count an enterprise manager being there once you got on a box. Uh, what, what I tend to find is I'll get on a fully patched uh, server 2008 R2 box with nothing but the minimal support libraries for whatever web application they're running. Um, typically though that web application is still their five or seven year old ASP app that they wrote in, in house and usually I can take advantage of that. Uh, certainly as I mentioned there are tools on the, on the Linux Unix side like SSH uh, dynamic port forwarding that can kind of do this and certainly uh, as Dave mentioned in, in Metasploit Pro uh, you've got that VPN functionality. Uh, that's not available to everybody so I wanted to uh, get something out there that others could use and, and also I find uh, there's a lot of times when I don't necessarily want to use Metasploit for one reason or another. So I kind of came up with some basic objectives. I wanted to have something that would be relatively small payload. Uh, as long as I'm dropping on a server that's got the Visual C runtime installed, I can get it down currently to about 13K today. It's a little bigger, it's about 70K if I have to uh, put a statically linked binary out there. Um, I, I do believe that we can get that a little bit smaller uh, as we work on it some more. 
I definitely wanted something that didn't need any elevated privileges because it tended to be the case that I'd end up as IIS user or maybe I'm a local user on the machine. I uh, usually don't have any good escalation path. I may not even have a good shell. I might be working with some lousy web shell or something like that that's not very interactive. And finally, I wanted to make sure I could support simultaneous connections and stuff so that I would be able to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, do things like port scans with, with some efficiency. So, got a few slides here that just kind of show how you use the tool. Uh, first thing is I went with uh, environment variables to set things up. Um, if you've ever used something like TSOX, uh, you know that uh, it basically acts as a uh, library wrapper uh, around uh, whatever command line tool or, or whatever application you want to execute. Uh, of course, those tools aren't designed to take some of these uh, inputs. Uh, Dave, I don't think we have the picture, but that's all right. Anyway. I'm going to do interpretive dances here in a second, so we'll be fine. All right. So anyway, a, a lot of times uh, those tools don't have any ability to take the input information that I needed, so I thought the easiest way would be to go ahead and uh, communicate with environment variables. I went ahead and also the other piece to this that we'll introduce in a minute, the connection broker uses those same environment variables just so that setup's a little bit easier. Uh, the next step of course is actually to start that broker. Uh, and what that broker does is it will be listening for the incoming connections from both the service proxy component that you drop and uh, any application that you run when it makes connections outbound. Uh, the next step is somehow on our victim we need to go ahead and start the service proxy. Again, it doesn't need any special permissions. It's not doing anything like trying to bind low ports. It doesn't need to usually have any firewall rules open because we're going to go out on something that we know is, is going to be open like 80 and all the connections are going to be outbound so we're not listening. And finally, our last step is we go ahead and start our application. Uh, anybody who's used Linux is probably somewhat familiar with uh, using LD preload. What that does is basically it says, hey, load this library first. So when the dynamic linker comes along and gets a call to a function like connect that would normally be in the sockets library, it comes across mine first and runs that, which uh, does a few things, mainly re-steers the traffic over to the broker uh, and then basically performs the con uh, connection and, and side effects that connect would normally perform within the program. So uh, if you've ever seen a SOX proxy before, maybe you've uh, used SOX cap or something like that on Windows or TSOX on Linux, uh, usually there's two pieces. There's a SOX proxy out there someplace and then you have your, your SOXification wrapper. Uh, basically I cut a third piece out and move the connection broker uh, away from the proxy server itself so that it can do all the listening locally on your machine and we can have a single uh, connection back from the proxy server to that connection broker which will allow us to basically multiplex all our traffic into that single socket so we don't see multiple firewall events and stuff that would typically give us away if we were uh, opening a lot of separate connections out. So once we, uh, once we have the proxy connected up, our, our library wrapper will uh, read the environment and make sure those uh, connect events, uh, get host by name and, and a few other things like that. Uh, actually go over to our broker. Our broker um, essentially listens to those messages, accepts those proxy connections and then creates a simple message that it can send down its existing socket over to the proxy. And finally, it uses a fairly simple protocol to do that. It's basically a fixed size protocol uh, which I'll show you on the next page here. Uh, you'll, you'll see um, actually I've got, oh boy, we're losing the image again. Okay. Anyway. Um, Typically in a SOX proxy what we had in the past was one connection to the proxy server meant one connection to the remote host. Obviously that wasn't going to work in this case so I had to come up with some other method of uh, letting the proxy server keep uh, order as far as uh, where replies needed to go and things like that. So I decided that uh, basically uh, process ID and the file descriptor within that process should be unique enough. And in addition to that, we have a, a simple command and it's just an integer type uh, value that's enumerated. Uh, and usually those are something like connect, close, uh, get host by name. So as I was implementing it, I did run into a few surprises. Uh, even though we know WinSock uh, basically evolved from BSD sockets, 
uh, the status codes and return values were different. So I discovered I had to do a little bit of mapping on the, on the Windows side before I fed those values right back to uh, the Linux programs I was running. Um, as I was debugging and trying to figure all this out at first, uh, it, it led to some interesting chaos uh, that I think exercised some code paths and some things like Netcat that uh, never were intended to be hit. Uh, mainly because you know things would happen like you'd get a valid uh, file descriptor for a connected socket, but yet you'd be getting some return code that that meant some sort of failure, and and so behavior was a uh, rather chaotic. Uh, it turned out on the library side, I really didn't actually need to implement too many functions because um, it was a relatively thin wrapper around the connect call most of the time, or around the get host by name, or get at or info type functions, and those actually then just performed the connect to the broker piece otherwise in the usual way. So I didn't have to re-implement the actual socket function or anything like that. I didn't have to necessarily get into all the flow control and, and pieces that would have been more complicated. Uh, just a few other things before I launch into our demo here. Um, I did look around for some code on the internet before I wrote anything, uh, of course, because you never want to reinvent the wheel and, and most people are better programmers than I am, even though I did it for a number of years. Um, what I found typically with most of the open source SOX proxies out there was they were implemented, again, with that idea of one connection in would be one connection out kind of at their very core, so they didn't have a lot of internal housekeeping that I could leverage when I was going to have to route things back based on file descriptor and uh, PID number and things like th of that nature or come up with some other strategy. So I couldn't use a lot of that code or at least couldn't use it easily, so I decided to go ahead and write my own thing, uh, which is maybe good and bad, I don't know. Of course I made uh, decisions along the way that every C programmer is familiar with. Uh, I decided of course to use linked lists so I could keep the traffic uh, flowing in, basically always ready to read on the wire. Um, and also as far as connected sockets on the outside to remote hosts, sort in a B tree form. In, in retrospect, I really wish I would have used like a fixed size array and, and, and stepped over it like that. Uh, it would have been a much simpler data structure and probably would have led to a simpler implementation. Although ultimately it does seem like the binary tree and stuff uh, performs pretty well. So I decided to continue to live with that for a while. We'll see how uh, things evolve. Um, I did go ahead and decide to video the demo for you guys today mainly because I'm a terrible typist and you don't really want to sit here while I make a whole bunch of typographical errors and, and things like that. So we're going to do a little bit of pretending. I've got a vulnerable web application here. Uh, you may be familiar with this. It's a software testing tool from a little while ago. It's running on a public 172 IP. Uh, there's some other stuff on this DMZ that we're going to get to that's on another 172 space that my attacking uh, PCs can't, can't see directly first thing I'm doing here is uh, taking advantage of this testing tool a little bit. I'm essentially setting up a test that's going to call PowerShell and rig up a file drop. It'll make the request back to an Apache server I have running. So it's, it's run or it's continuing to run here and we're going to see in a second that I actually get an error back from PowerShell. That'll be important later. It, it tells me that some extra stuff is being tacked on the end of the command line. So you'll see me use PowerShell again just to manage the arguments that need to get passed. Um, certainly the next thing that happens is I go over and I'm going to look at my Apache log and I do see that that get request happened so I know my file drop was at least partially successful, the request happened, hopefully it got written to the disk. That's the end of this one. So the next thing we need to do is start getting stuff set up on our attacking box. Uh, you'll see me actually go ahead twice here and set up the environment in two different tabs. Certainly I could set up the environment once and then back around the broker. Uh, in this case I'm choosing not to do that because I want to run the broker with the debug flags enabled and probably run my uh, library without them. Uh, main reason not to run the library with them is it does introduce a lot of extra stuff on standard error that sometimes kind of confuses the output of whatever tool I'm using, makes it difficult to work with. But it's there so you can debug what's going on if something's not working the way you think it should. However, you do get a lot of good debug output from the broker itself that, that usually lets me know what's going on. So. I'll uh, typically run the broker in a separate tab. It is possible to do this tool with uh, some shell injection and, and by a PowerShell, reflective DLL injection loading and stuff like that. In this case I went with a simple file drop uh, just for the sake of the demo. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that obviously and most of the time it works. Typically uh, in terms of cleanup that's not all that hard because it's just one file I got to delete later. So not, not too many issues there. 
So we're getting ready here with the rest of the environment variables. And I hope that's big enough that people can see it. I don't know. <laughs> no. Yeah, we can do full screen. I got it. Don't you you got it? Yeah. All right. Do you I, may I may have deleted the videos. Though. Uh, I hope you didn't delete the videos. <laughs> nope. Right here. Excellent. Which one is it, two? Oh, I think we were on two. I guess we'll know in a second. Is it a little better? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start interpretive dances here real quick. All right, okay? so Dave's going to do his interpretive dances. Now you'll notice, I've, uh, I, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but I'm going ahead and stopping Apache. One of the reasons I'm doing that, of course, is I'm going to go instruct my proxy to come back out on port 80. Why? Because I already know it's open, so I don't need to fool with the, you know, any more guessing whether the firewall is going to let me out. Okay, so at this point we are ready to start the broker. We've got our environment set up. We'll get the separate second tab going. And once I get this environment set up, I'm actually going to pivot to a network that's surprisingly interesting to pivot to that I didn't imagine would be so interesting at first, uh, the 127 network. Uh, turns out a lot of people tend to write firewall rules that uh, trust local host a lot. Uh, certainly when you open a new socket, usually the source IP address will take the adapter that that network is uh, native on. Uh, so traffic will look like it's coming from localhost and it'll end up going to localhost once we do this. So now the next step here, I think, and I guess we gotta go to the next video, Dave. Can you do that for me? Thank you. Computers are hard. Computers are hard. So I'm going to go ahead and use the same injection technique actually to invoke my proxy. Basically I'm setting up another test here. And by all these commands uh, we have at the end of this, you know, we have a blog post that we did and all of this and all the source and all that good stuff. So, you know, reproducing off of this is a little bit difficult, but we have all of the commands uh, on our website that we put a blog post on, so. Great. Once again, I, I just did a really simple PowerShell wrapper there uh, just to swallow the extra stuff that's going to come on the end of it so it doesn't confuse uh, my application. I do have something in the little toolbox that we'll talk about later that can substitute some IP addresses into the uh, binary without having to recompile it just to simplify things a little bit. I think we're in the, into the next video here, Dave. So now I'm uh, using LD preload. I'm going to go ahead and use our desktop. I'm going to hit hit the box on localhost. Um, re again, reason for that. Essentially now, even though I'm sure the firewall isn't going to let 3389 in, now I'm going through my tunnel and I'm going to be coming from localhost as far as that box is concerned. And I'm going to localhost, even if they are running a local software firewall bo on that box. Uh, I'm going to likely be able to do that. And I have PowerShell. The other, uh, not PowerShell, um, remote desktop. Uh, the other reason I wanted to run remote desktop for you guys is just to show you that uh, we can support more than just text mode protocols and, and actually feed a, a fair amount of data through this thing at a reasonable rate. So this is just me playing around. I, I'm guessing that hey, maybe the application that or the password that worked on that web application will also work on the desktop. Uh, it doesn't look like I'm uh, being real successful. Uh, just showing you again that I don't need to necessarily get any additional access to that box. We're going to be able to continue this attack on other network hosts behind it. <laughs> so at this point I'm going to try some uh, other attacks here. I think we're playing the wrong video but that, that's fine. Uh, no, let's let, let play Dave. We'll, we'll go with it. Um, this is just an example of scanning with uh, Netcat. Um, I can't scan with uh, Nmap directly. Uh, Nmap wants to use raw sockets and things like that which are uh, a little hard to work with uh, unfortunately and we wouldn't be able to implement on the Windows side without some privileges. So you'll see what I did here is I'm just using uh, the V and Z switches on, on Netcat and scanning for 445. Pretty good way to find uh, Windows hosts. Uh, I would like to point out 
The proxy, of course, can uh, handle multi-threading in terms of making outbound connections on the remote side. So if you want to speed up your scan instead of linearly stepping through every IP address, you could certainly run uh, multiple uh, Netcat scans in parallel. Just break up that 24 you want to scan into, you know, blocks of 10 or something like that, and and run three or four wide at a time is what I'll usually do. I'm gonna continue to let you drive, Dave, rather than try to. That's scary. <laughs> figure out how to use your 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 uh, trackpad settings. So I did find a box. Um, we were we were ha pen testing a web application here, so chances are there's a database somewhere. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and see if uh, my SQL is going to work. So you see me editing my command there. Um, again, uh, you know, in, in an actual attack scenario, without having compromised that box, I'd have to put a lot more footprint on it. I'd have to be dropping down tools to inter to interact with that database, uh, any other tools I wanted to use, any kind of DNS recon I wanted to do. Uh, things of that nature, because those utilities probably aren't on that box for me. So what Pivoter is really allowing me to do here for the first time is go ahead and just use tools that I natively have installed on my Kali VM and attack those other VMs behind or those other uh, other machines on that DMZ that are behind that uh, victim box. Uh, turns out apparently that this database won't actually talk to me, which is interesting. I guess we'll go to the next video. So there's a little situation with DNS that doesn't always work uh, the way we would we would have hoped to. Uh, to that end, I wrote another tool uh, that just helps me do some additional DNS recon while I'm using uh, Pivoter. Uh, and you can see, since we still have that one host that I know about, I'm going to do some things that typically work on a pen test. Uh, typically, a company of any size, there's always an intranet. So I'm going to look for that address. And sure enough, I got back uh, that same address I had before. Uh, which probably tells me that maybe that database there is, is actually to support uh, another web app or something like that. And, and finally, I went ahead and looked up an outside address. That's another thing I'll always do uh, here to show you that I can get back all the addresses with this tool. But certainly if we see different, different DNS resolution inside versus outside, uh, we know some things about uh, how their network is set up as well. Um, Again, just to point out what's going on with the DNS here is I'm actually performing those DNS resolutions via the proxy. So DNS is happening from the perspective of the victim box, not my local Cali box here. So I can see their internal DNS space. Uh, the other thing I decided to do with the DNS resolution is I went ahead and um, even even if you use the uh, get host adder in, or get adder info uh, family of functions on the Linux side, they map back to the old get host by name function on the Windows side. Uh, the reason for that is that falls back to wins. So I actually end up getting wins information as well even when there's no DNS uh, response. Anyway, more to come. Uh, certainly there's, there's a lot more work to do. Um, there are some limitations with the tools. I, I talked about DNS a little bit. I think we're a few slides back. Yeah, so some workarounds, DNS recon. So this was, and I know you can't read it, so we won't dwell on the slide. It's a really simple DNS resolver. All it does is call get adder info and look it up. It's not actually uh, pivoter aware in any way when you when you call it, as you saw in the demo. Uh, you actually just wrap it with the library the way you would anything else. We talked quickly about uh, how to speed up some of that scanning uh, with Nmap, or rather with uh, Netcap. And, and yes, there's uh, definitely more work to do. We certainly want to wrap some more SOX calls. Uh, it would be nice to maybe do some interpreter in, uh, integration just to make things easy. I'd say overall the tools at that point where we had that uh, lump of enriched uranium on top of the tower in the desert with a bunch of explosives around it, yeah, we can make it go boom. Uh, it's not fully weaponized yet. Uh, typically on a pen test I'm still uh, altering it and doing a custom compile all the time. But it, it does work and it uh, does let us uh, continue on. And I guess I'll hand it back to Dave here. So I've been working on the, uh, the set integration into it. So the new version of set uh, 5.7 should be out in the next week or so. Um, should incorporate pivot attacks as a default payload as well. So when you're going into Meterpreter and doing your payloads, it'll automatically run an additional pivot tool on top of it. So you can still do most of your pen testing work inside of Metasploit, inside of MSF Console, inside of you know, most of your tools that you would typically use um, on a pen test as part of it. Uh, additionally, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to see um, the pen testers framework, um, but I'm going to show you a quick demo of it. This is a tool that I released um, about two weeks ago. And The biggest issue that you have um, with most, you know, pen test distributions, like we all love Cali, and Cali is near to dear to our heart, and it's awesome and amazing. It's the best 
uh, distribution out there. We also roll our own in a lot of cases, right? We roll our own tools and our own uh, pen testing distributions. The biggest thing that I found as being a, a tester all the time is making sure that I had all the latest and greatest tools out there. Um, so I released the pen testers framework about two weeks ago, which is a modular framework um, around keeping all of your tools up to date. And right now there's over 46 modules um, that have been written for tools. Um, and what it does is it's literally simple, simple use. I mean, you can just type, you know, you git clone it from, um, from um, GitHub. I like it in my, I like it in my armpit. It's good in my armpit. So if I just git clone it from GitHub. It'll go and grab the latest distribution for it and then you're, um, every time you run it from there on out, it'll automatically update itself so you're running the latest module. So whenever there's a new module added, it'll automatically go into there. Like for example, just to show you how easy it is, uh, I don't know if you saw the uh, Empire tool from Harnjoy and the other guys out there. Really great talk. Um, within about an hour, someone had already written a module for that and it was already pushed to the, the PTF framework and then you could get that tool almost as soon as it was released. Same thing with this. We just, I just pushed while Jeff was talking, I pushed the GitHub repo for Pivoter. The module has just been added as well. And I'll show you how easy it is. You just run PTF. So it checks for the internet connection first, it tries to update itself and if it's running the latest and greatest, it's all set. And then uh, of course you know, any tool has got to have ASCII art. Um, but then it's just kind of like Metasploit syntax, right? So I'll go ahead and set, hit show modules. And you can see here all the different tools that are available and it's a big screen, so it's, you know, it's kind of broken up. But you can see like Aircrack NG, Comics, um, you know, SQL Map, Inception, SMB Exec. All of those are there and if you want to install it, you just hit use modules and I'll do exploitation set. You just go and hit run and it automatically goes and installs the tool for you. Now if you just want to keep it up to date, as soon as you hit run again, it'll automatically detect that it's been installed and automatically up to, uh, up to date it for you. Now let's just say you want to do all tools. There's an uh, option here that will hit modules slash install underscore update all. So it'll either install the tools for you or automatically update it for you. So you have a um, common distribution point for all of your tools. And I missed the uh, slash pen test directory. I don't know if anybody used backtrack or anything below, but I've structured everything around the pen test directory. So when you go to the slash pen test directory, it's broken into the penetration testing execution standard methodology. So, you know, exploitation, post exploitation, you know, reconnaissance, those types of things, intelligence gathering. Um, those are all structured in that type of framework. And I've also added Pivoter. So you can search for Pivoter and it's in there as well. So if you just go and use this module. Go and run it. Takes a second, internet's slow, and it's hard. It's done, and you have Pivoter. Easy to go. So a really easy framework. The the um the way that you actually add a module real quick is if you go under modules, I've created a whole um I've created a whole framework around um building modules that you don't have to require any type of coding whatsoever uh background. You can literally create a module in about three minutes. Uh, so let's just go to exploitation. Let's go to set. So the, uh, the, mo the author of the module, the description of the module, right? So the description is going to be, hey, this is the social engineer toolkit. Um, install type, it supports um, git, svn, and file. So file is if it's like a, a, a zip file that you need to go and pull, it'll automatically go and grab it and then unzip it and then extract it for you into that directory. And then the repository location that it needs to go to pull it. And then any Debian uh, dependencies. Uh, right now I have Debian as the main support, but I'm working on Red Hat as well. Um, so you should have RPM support shortly. And then after commands are things that might occur after you've installed something. Like if you, after you've checked it out, you may need to run like install.sh or things like that. After commands will sequence through um, all the commands. Like so a complex one would be Metasploit. Metasploit is an extremely complex one to install. So it does all of the installation um, procedures for you to install Metasploit for you automatically after it's done um, getting everything out and installs all the dependencies and all those other things. Uh, additionally, it's pretty efficient. It'll go and install all the modules for you. Um, if you're doing the update all, it'll install the modules real time and then do everything consecutively in a threaded um, uh, shell. So it'll go through and install everything for you automatically, which is great. So Pivoter is now released. You can go to github.com slash trustedsec slash Pivoter. It has the latest code base into it. Uh, it also links to a blog that walks you through exactly how to set it up, exactly what you need to do to route your traffic through, um, you know, the pivoter as well as to do uh, lateral movement post exploitation. Uh, you know, hopefully it's it's going to be an evolution, so we're going to continuously make it better as we go along. Um, but one of the things that I know Jeff is doing is is continuously updating it as it goes along, and we'll continue to add 
um, different changes to it. But if you go to github.com slash stressetsec, all the code's there, and I really appreciate everybody coming out to the talk, and uh, hopefully you uh, get some sleep here in the next uh, three weeks. Thanks, everybody.